Now, what about the other side, the Democrats? Well, Doug, Lincoln's nomination makes it even more imperative that the Democrats prove Douglas, uh, nominate Douglas, who can fight Lincoln in the North. No, slave, no Southern Democrat could combat against Lincoln in the North. But the Democratic Party at this point is falling apart. By 1859, uh, the Deep South states have put forward what they call the Alabama Platform, right, which is a demand for federal legislation to guarantee slavery in all the territories. Implement the Dred Scott decision. Protect slavery in all the territories. Um, and by 1859, and you'll see next week in the Sina book about Southern politics, a growing number of, of um, a growing number of Southern leaders in the Deep South are already talking about secession in the event of a, uh, of a uh, Republican victory. Some of them are even calling for reopening the African slave trade, as I have mentioned. Um, and uh, they will not accept Douglas, Stephen A. Douglas, any more than Lincoln. Douglas has betrayed them, they feel, by not supporting the Dred Scott decision and sticking with his popular sovereignty doctrine. Um, basically, the Deep South has now come to the position which John C. Calhoun outlawed, uh, outlined in the 1840s, which is this federal government to protect slavery everywhere except in the states that have abolished it. Um, Douglas insisted the Democratic Party can never succeed with that as its platform, and his men go to, the candidates didn't go to the convention, but his men go to, the, the place the convention met is as important as for the Republicans. The Democratic Convention meets in Charleston, South Carolina, the center of secessionist sentiment. The Douglas men have a majority in the convention, but to get nominated in the Democratic Convention, in, to get a Dem the Democratic Party nomination, you needed two-thirds of the delegates. That was true all the way to the 1930s. That basically gave the South a veto power on, um, on the Democratic presidential candidates. They couldn't always nominate who they wanted, but they could always block whoever they didn't want. It was only in the second term of Franklin D. Roosevelt that a majority rule was adopted for the, uh, Republic, uh, the Democratic National Convention. So basically, the, the, the Douglas people cannot get Douglas nominated but the platform is approved by majority vote. So they push through a platform embracing popular sovereignty, whereupon the Southern delegates secede. They leave. The Southern delegates walk out of the, um, of the Charleston Convention. After much very angry yelling and screaming by Northern and Southern Democrats against each other. Um, what, what is, and so the, the convention is unable to nominate anybody, and they adjourn, basically, for six weeks, and they meet then again in Baltimore. By that point, the Douglas people seat pro-Douglas delegates from southern states. They don't want the other guys coming back in. The, southern delegate, the other southern delegates who are aspirants walk out again. Again, the point is just it splits up immediately into northern and democratic, northern and southern Democratic wings. Douglas is nominated. The people who walk out nominate John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky as a pro-slavery Democrat. So now you have two Democratic candidates running for president in 1860, Douglas and Breckinridge. So what, what has happened here? The, great, the last great bond of the Union has been shattered by the collapse of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party of Jackson, and even tracing its history really back to Jefferson, um, has now splintered. Um, and um, why? Well, at the Charleston Convention, uh, Rhett of South Carolina, one of the radicals, says, the Democratic Party has not one single principle common to its members North and South. There is nothing left holding the northern and southern wings of the Democratic Party together. Now, you can trace this breakup back. You can, and we should. Dred Scott, the Lecompton controversy, um, 
Go back further, even to 1844, when the South had blocked the nomination of Van Buren, even though he had a majority of the delegates because he was not in favor of the annexation of Texas as a slave state. Um, but the, the real point is, both sides were willing to see the Democratic Party break up. Douglas was willing to see it collapse on the theory that he would then put it back together. He knew that Lincoln was going to win now, but he said, all right, Lincoln will win. Four years from now, we will come back together, and the Democratic Party will reestablish itself as the dominant party in the country. That what will happen now will prove that we must have party unity, otherwise we can never succeed. And meanwhile, there were many Southerners who were willing to see the Democratic Party collapse because they were already looking toward the possibility of secession and a new, a new Southern nation. Both segments of the party were willing to let the Democratic Party collapse, so it collapsed. So now we've got three presidential candidates, right? Lincoln, Douglas, and Breckinridge. And then into the mix comes a fourth, the, a new party called the Constitutional Union Party, which basically represents the Upper South, which doesn't want to go down the secessionist route. The Constitutional Union Party, an attempt to reestablish the middle ground of politics. Their basic strength is in the Upper South. They nominate for president John Bell of Tennessee uh, with Edward Everett of Massachusetts as his vice presidential candidate. They're both what are called old Whigs. They are old, and they're Whigs. But there is no Whig party anymore. And this is, in a sense, the Whig party resurrecting itself among, Southern, among Southerners who still didn't want to go with the radical Democrats. So this is, what do they stand for? What do they stand for? They have a platform of one sentence. It just says, we stand for the Constitution and the laws. But since people are willing, almost going to war over different meanings of the Constitution, that's not sufficient. Um, the campaign of 1860 is a very dramatic era of American history. And the real protagonist of it is Stephen A. Douglas. Douglas breaks with tradition, a tradition which lasts long after this, and goes out and campaigns for president. You're not supposed to do that in the 19th century. Nobody else did that in the 19th century until like 1896 when, when Bryan started going around giving speeches all over the place. You're supposed to sit at home and allow the people to choose you. Douglas goes out and speaks. He speaks in the places he has the least support. He goes to New England and says, we must compromise with the South. But then, with great uh, courage, we might say, he goes to the South. He goes to v Virginia, and by the fall, he's down in Alabama. He's in the heartland of secessionism, in Montgomery, in Mobile. What is the message he's bringing there? It's not vote for me. It's don't be deluded into thinking that the North will be divided if you secede. Northern Democrats will support the administration if conflict breaks out over an effort to break up the Union. He goes down there, he says, we are going to stand with the Republicans in the event of a civil war. And, and to, he's trying to stop the movement toward uh, disunion. Um, in a sense, it's Douglas's finest hour. He's trying to resurrect the politics of the Union at a time when it's almost impossible to do so. Did the split of the Democratic Party guarantee the election of Lincoln? Many people think that would be the case, but it actually isn't if you, if you think about it. In a certain sense, it would have been easier for Lincoln to run against a compromised Democratic candidate or a Southern Democratic candidate. Lincoln in the North is now running against a Northern Democrat, a guy who has fought the Buchanan administration. In a sense, Douglas, as a candidate without the South, who stood up to the South, is better positioned to fight against Lincoln in the North than would have been a united Democratic Party. But more to the point, because of our peculiar electoral system, even if the votes of all the other candidates, Douglas, Breckinridge, Bell, even if all their votes had united on one candidate, Lincoln still would have been elected. This is our electoral system. As you all know, or you should know, we 
people do not elect the president. We elect electors who elect the president. And the guy who wins the, elector, the popular vote sometimes loses the electoral vote, as happened with Gore in 2000 and other times. So it's not just a direct election of the president, as people discover every four years. TV people suddenly find this out, and they call up historians, and they say, what is this electoral college? What are, why do we have it? Lincoln got 40% of the national vote. Lincoln got about 60%, 55 to 60% of the northern vote. That is a landslide in the north. He defeated Douglas with 55 to 60%. He carried every single northern state. Unfortunately, this map, it's a little hard to tell the difference between the red, which are the Republican states, and then the orange, Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, is what Bell carries. But if you look at the, Lincoln carries the entire north, with the exception of a state which is always doing its own thing, New Jersey, <laughs> which split its electoral votes, uh, halfway for Lincoln and half for Douglas. But anyway, he carries the whole north, but nationally, he only has 40% of the vote. 60% vote to the other three. But even if that 60 had been on one candidate, he still wins the electoral vote because he gets no votes in the South whatsoever. In 10 Southern states, he's not even on the ballot. Gets a few votes in the Upper South, but hardly anything. Breckinridge wins the Lower South and creeps up into North Carolina, but the key Upper South states, you see Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, go for Bell. There is no solid South in the election of 1860, politically speaking. The South is united by slavery, but not in politics at this point. Douglas only gets one state, Missouri, and yet Douglas comes in second in the popular vote. Douglas is the only guy who gets votes North and South, which is a kind of vindication of his politics, although he's, it's not good enough to win any, any states either north or south except for this one state of Missouri. So Lincoln, you know, you can look at it as a great triumph for Lincoln in carrying the entire north, or you can say nationally Lincoln got the same percentage of the vote as George McGovern did in, in 1972, or Mondale did in uh, 1984. In other words, 40% is a landslide loss in most cases, but not in this case. This is a, but the obvious thing when you look at this map is the sectional division of politics, the line running through the nation of, uh, on, on politics. Um, so, uh, you know, but this is what the country has come to at this point. One other irony. The Democrats recapture control of Congress in the election of 1860. There are many in the South. As I say, the South is united by slavery. It is not united on secession. It is not united in the election. There are many in the South and say, well, look, all right, Lincoln's elected, but we're going to control Congress. The, or at least the Democratic Party is going to control Congress. The Republicans aren't. What can Lincoln do? Lincoln can't just abolish slavery, or at least why act now? Why try to break up the Union now? Let us wait for what people called an overt act. Let's say Lincoln does something dangerous for us. Then we secede. But to secede just because someone won an election seems rather foolish, foolhardy, dangerous. Um, Wait, what do we have to fear? But by this point, there is a very powerful cadre in the Lower South, which has been committed to secession for years and now sees their opportunity. So next time we will see the secession of the South, Lincoln's reaction, and the outset of the Civil War. So we'll see you next Monday.